Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the East Bay Region Park District Board Executive Committee meeting. Today is Tuesday, June 8th, and it is 12.33, and we are on time, almost. Uh, Madam Clerk, can you please take a roll call? Yes, uh, this is Becky Fang, recording secretary taking roll. President Rosario? Here. Director Corbett? Here. Director Coffey? Here. Okay, and Park District staff participating in today's meeting include uh, General Manager Sabrina Landreth, uh, Deputy General Manager Ana Alvarez, uh, AGM Christina Kelchner, uh, AGM Jim O'Connor, and then we have Brian Holt, Edward Willis, Matthew James, uh, Rachel Arbius, uh, Devin Reef, and let's see, I believe that's it. <clears throat> Today's board executive committee meeting is held in accordance with Governor Newsom's executive order, allowing for board members to participate in standing committee meetings remotely. We are providing live audio and video streaming. The public can provide comments three ways, live via Zoom, by submitting an email or leaving a voicemail as noted on the agenda. This information can be found on the agenda, which is posted on the district's website at www.evparks.org. If there are no questions about the meeting procedures, we will begin. Great. And Madam Secretary, can, uh, do we have any public comments? We have no public comments at this time. Excellent. Then we can start our agenda. And, uh, Item number two is Roddy Ranch Public Access Restoration Plan, an update. Good afternoon, uh, members of the executive committee. Um, I'm Brian Holt, Chief of Planning, Trails, and GIS. I'm going to quickly introduce uh, this item and the next. Um, this, the Roddy Ranch presentation will be given by um, Eddie Willis, a planner in the planning department. Um, these are two projects that are kind of uh, still relatively early in the planning phase as we are starting to uh, develop some concept alternatives. Um, so we wanted to take the opportunity to bring these uh, concepts at this stage uh, to the executive committee to get your um, initial input, uh, feedback, any, um, any direction that you may have. Um, we're not asking the committee to pick an alternative or to um, to make any decision on um, A, B, or C. It's likely we will take components of each of these alternatives and uh, develop a preferred alternative. And of course, we will be uh, bringing that back to uh, to the executive committee, the PAC, and the board um, per our our normal process. But this is a, an opportunity for the board to provide. Um, just some uh, initial comments, sort of get a status update um, and, and review where we're at today. So, um, so with that, I'm gonna hand over the first item on Roddy Ranch to, uh, to Edward Willis. Eddie, you ready to go? All right, I hope you can all hear me. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, again, Eddie Willis, I'm a planner for East Bay Regional Parks. And I'm going to be sharing with you an update on the Roddy Ranch planning project taking place in eastern Contra Costa County. And that's part of the larger future Deer Valley Regional Preserve. Um, I see on the call that we are joined by uh, Eric Stromberg. He is our project manager with Restoration Design Group. And they're the consultants that we hired to help develop a habitat restoration public access plan. And we're also joined by Abby Fateman, who is the executive director of the East Contra Costa County Habitat Conservancy. So, hey, Abby. So thank you, uh, members of the board and uh, staff and uh, folks listening at home. So I'm going to pull up my screen for the presentation. I need just another second here. Okay, hopefully that's a full screen for everyone. So this is a joint project between East Bay Regional Park District and the East Contra Costa County Habitat Conservancy. Uh, we began uh, the first work of this project about a year ago, the spring of 2020. And I just wanna acknowledge our funding and project partners. Uh, in addition to the Park District and the East County Habitat Conservancy, I uh, want to acknowledge the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, 
and the California Wildlife Conservation Board. Okay, so Roddy Ranch is a 230-acre former golf course nested within the larger future Deer Valley Regional Preserve. Uh, those are the working names. Um, we'll eventually decide on the final name for these, pro for these properties, but those are our working names for them. Uh, it's part of a roughly 14,000 acres of uh, Habitat Conservancy land, which includes large portions near uh, Vasco Road, Vasco Caves area, Roddy Ranch south of Antioch, and the area south of Black Diamond that we're calling Clayton Ranch. And so the main focus of these lands is habitat restoration and um, preservation. All right, some uh, recent history, the lands, the former golf course was most recently owned by Jack and Donna Roddy, who moved to the area in the 1970s and owned a couple thousand acres of land and built the Roddy Ranch Golf Course in the early 2000s, uh, which closed in 2016. And a couple years later, the Park District and the Habitat Conservancy purchased the land to protect it in perpetuity. So here's a basic overview of the general park development process. We have these different major phases that uh, properties go through. First phase is acquisition, where we purchase land or it's donated to us. Right now we're in the planning phase, uh, which is doing environmental assessments, developing plans, et cetera. Afterwards, it moves on to design and construction, and then ultimately the operations phase, which is when it's open to the public and being managed day to day by park staff. Uh, within the planning phase, we're toward the middle of that process. So we uh, conducted field studies on site uh, through much of last year, checking uh, soil conditions, the topography, uh, and things of that nature. That culminated, culminated in an existing conditions report, which was published in March of this year. And that led us to uh, today's item, which are the draft alternatives. And we'll take feedback from these alternatives from decision makers, members of the public to develop a preferred alternative. And then finally, a, a, a public or a habitat restoration public access plan, which will be voted on by um, our board and the Habitat Conservancy. Uh, these are the overarching goals for the Roddy Ranch project. We have uh, two categories, restoration goals and recreation goals. As on the restoration side, habitat, um, restoring grassland habitat, wetlands is a, is a top priority. On the recreation side, opening up the former golf course uh, to trails using existing infrastructure. And I'll go into some more detail a little further on in the presentation. All right, we'll take a quick virtual site tour at ground level. So this is the staging area at the former golf course looking east toward Brentwood. On a clear day, you can see the Sierra Nevada in the distance. This is a approximately 140 space parking lot uh, that served the golf course for, for many years. Uh, that's looking east. This is the same spot looking west. In the foreground are the remains of the former clubhouse that was at the golf course for a period and off in the distance looking west is Black Diamond Mines. A uh, close up of some of the remaining infrastructure, the redwood deck behind the clubhouse. Uh, the landscape is uh, rolling hillsides, very open, uh, about 95% grassland with um, a few trees here and there and some potential wetland habitat near the base of the hills. About six miles of former golf cart track, uh, carts, former infrastructure, uh, an old outhouse near the west end of the future park. One of three ponds that were used to irrigate the golf course may become future wetland habitat. And a lot of the topography was modified for golf course uses. This is the old driving range, but certain areas of the land were flattened out or, or steeper than, um, than would naturally occur out there. So all things that we've looked at to come up with some draft alternatives. Uh, the golf course closed, closed down in 2016. This is an aerial from 2017, not long after the closure. And it, and it shows the, uh, the sand traps on site, the miles and miles of golf cart tracks, and the three ponds at the north, which are at the downhill part of the property. All right, so this 
This informed uh, restoration design groups uh, map here, which is sort of a guiding map for developing the draft alternatives. It's broken into three major zones. So at the bottom right is the park entry zone in green. And that's the area around the, the future staging area where um, we're projecting uh, picnic sites, the restroom, uh, trailheads, and the parking area. Uh, the blue fingers that you see are the wetland and drainage zone, which show potential uh, wetland habitat restoration. And then uh, the rest of it is the upland trail restoration zone. Okay, so this, this is the base map that informs the draft alternatives. So I think we'll jump into those next. So, the, so concept A, we're calling Welcome the Wetlands. And this one is really focused on developing uh, vernal pools, which are seasonal ponds uh, that fill with rainwater, uh, looking at uh, restoring drainages and wetland areas at the, uh, at the base of the hills. And so we've got some stats on, on the left and sort of an overview there. So this is, this is floating above the site, looking toward the west, toward Black Diamond Mines. So staging areas at the bottom, and this is looking out across the property. The, the dotted lines, which you'll see in each of these draft alternatives, are accessible trails. So folks with, um, you know, any mobility issues or um, what have you, should be able to access these trails. And then we have multi-use trails, which are in solid. Um, so this, this is really focused on wetland and habitat creation from the site. Uh, we've got some bioretention areas in between the parking stalls, which will help filter rainwater and run off from the parking lot. Okay, so we'll move to the next one. Concept B, we're calling Roddy Ranch Reuse. And this one is focus mostly on uh, using existing infrastructure, golf cart paths and so forth. And so this follows a lot of the existing trails here. We've got a couple of accessible loops. We've got a viewpoint way out at the West End, which may become a future trail connection to Black Diamond Mines up here. Um, all of these concepts include wetland restoration and trails. It's just that um, some lean a little more toward one or the other. Um, and this one has a central gathering area and picnic site with an interpretive pavilion and picnic area down here. All right, restroom's been moved over to the side. And we'll go to concept C, which is uh, focus on flow. And this concept has the, the most uh, trails in it compared to the other ones. Uh, so there's a large accessible loop there are some suggested multi-use trails which may be um, favorable to mountain bikes and to avoid trail conflict it's been suggested that uh, certain sections of the trail will be downhill only for mountain bikes and other sections uphill only for mountain bikes to really optimize the experience uh, but would be accessible for other users in either direction uh, one point here is it priorita prioritizes CTS or California tiger salamander habitat. All right. Uh, there's a bioretention basin down at the old driving range uh, just below the parking lot as well. And so I'll just click back through each of them. You can see some subtle changes. So they all include trails. They all include picnic sites. They all include restrooms and habitat restoration. They're just uh, a little different. Um, and as Brian mentioned, we can, there are options to pick and choose. We don't have to accept A, B, or C in its entirety. We can, uh, we can be selective, but these are some options based on um, cost, topography, uh, habitat restoration and creation, and uh, an enjoyable user experience. All right, so here's a summary table showing uh, restoration features for each of the concepts. Uh, some include a lot of vernal pools, others maybe um, no vernal pools, but focused on the larger ponds at the base. And so that's a summary of the restoration. Here's a summary of the recreation, which would be uh, the public access component. And different lengths of multi-use trails, uh, different numbers of uh, viewpoints, and so on. All right, so there's a summary. Uh, this is a list of our milestones. We've, we've hit 
several of these already this year. We, we had our, our initial public meeting back in March, uh, developed the draft alternatives just late last month, beginning of this month. Uh, today's board executive committee meeting, we're gonna have a PAC meeting at the end of this month and public meeting number two, where we'll present this uh, more broadly to the general public will be on July 1st. And then uh, public meeting number three sometime in the fall following environmental review and then final plan adoption, we're hoping sometime uh, in the winter of 2021, 2022. Okay, so that concludes uh, the update on the Roddy Ranch Habitat Restoration Public Access Planning. And I'm happy to take questions or go back through slides if anyone would like, or I can just pull down the screen. I'll, t I'll just take direction from other folks. Great. Um, you can leave your screen up. Questions from the board? Is, is there a... Oops. Go ahead. <laughs> is there a way to show the, the trail configuration in A, B, and C uh, side by side? We, uh, we, we have both... Uh, what I showed are perspective views, so sort of a bird's eye view from the air, but those are coupled with plan views, which are um, map views of the site. Uh, we went with the perspectives for this presentation, just it, it was a little more screen friendly, but we're gonna be getting those up on the website soon so that you can see them all lined up next yes. to each other. And I'm happy to go back. I was actually asking for something uh, much less intensive than that, but the, the three maps that you did show us of the trails, is it possible for you to put all three of them on the screen for us to see? Uh, oh, for right now? Yeah, is that possible? I Because it's very hard to look, to look at them so quickly and give you some perspective. It's easier for me to see, see them next to each other. I don't okay. know if you can do that, I, but if you can, it would be great. I may be able to just, just pull out of the presentation, throw the images together and then pull it back up. Yeah. But I, I apologize for not being prepared for that. And I would just no, say um, for the future, I know we often as colleagues on the board ask this question, if we could please get these presentations prior to meetings, especially while we're in the Zoom environment, it really helps because we can take a look and uh, really understand what you're talking about instead of just seeing it fly past us on the screen. Yes. So if you can do that for the future, and I think if we can develop a policy that for all of our committee meetings and our board meetings to have the material in advance, it would be really, really great. But thank you. <laughs> okay. Director Overall, Corbin. Just, um, very exciting choices. Yes. I was just going to, I was just going to add, I, I appreciate those comments and, um, we can certainly uh, do that in the future. I think the intent here is not to necessarily get all of the comments um, during this meeting. Um, as Eddie said, he will be posting the alternatives on the website. So I would consider this kind of a, a introduction and overview of the process. And then we're totally open to having um, discussions and taking additional input through, I mean, we're in a long sort of um, uh, input gathering process here. So, um, so we'll be able to provide more details as we move forward and, and we'll be posting those on the website. I do understand, but I, I still, it's uh, it's hard to give any feedback at all today without seeing them next to each other. For me anyway, yeah. that would not be the same problem for others, but. No, I understood, I appreciate that. Right. Director Coffey. So Eddie, you mentioned uh, the existing almost six miles of uh, golf cart paths. Mm -hmm. And those are all paved. To the extent we use those, are we going to be pulling up the old pavement and repaving or converting some to natural ground? How, how are we going to convert those into our type of trails? So um, as I understand, not, not all of it is accessible. So areas that have a more gentle grade, we may be able to keep existing golf cart paths. Uh, as they are paved, but areas that divert away from that may become natural surface trails. Um, I know that there's concern 
uh, with equestrians sort of uh, taking horses across uh, a hard surface and maybe natural surface would be more enjoyable. Same thing for mountain bikers. So it's going to be a combination of uh, existing hard surface and then in areas that are modified, uh, maybe more of a natural surface. We haven't settled on the width of the trails. We want them to be multi-use, but that doesn't necessarily mean the very wide trails that we see in a lot of our parks. It could be a little more narrow than that. Uh, the, the nice thing about Roddy Ranch is the sight lines are, are very nice. You can see in the distance, there's not a whole lot of blind curves. So we don't anticipate um, too many user conflicts with uh, having very narrow trails. If, uh, if Eric Stromberg is on the line, maybe he's our project manager for restoration design group. He might be able to speak to uh, yeah. some of that. Yeah, Eddie, I think you, you said the, the core piece of it. <clears throat> I, I think that's one of the feedback elements we kind of want to understand is what do we want um, or what does the park district want there um, for trails? So logistically, um, even most of the accessible trails are trying to use existing golf cart paths, but sometimes they're not meeting cross slope requirements. And sometimes we have to kind of skip and patch together pieces. So if the direction were to, okay, let's actually have the multi-use accessible trail to be paved, um, then we would, we would have to patch and replace and add new concrete to match to make that work smoothly. There is not an instance where we could just fully adopt an existing car path and, and call it good. So it's either kind of a patchwork or it would be converting it to one consistent surface throughout. Yeah, and if you're gonna make these trails or include trails that are mountain bike friendly, I assume you're gonna to have to create natural paths, maybe, maybe parallel to existing paths. Is, is that what the concept would entail? Making yeah, it. so I think there would be there would be somewhat of a hierarchy here. So everything I did would be multi-use for all users. Um, the accessible trails would be a higher standard of accessibility, so running slope and cross slope and surface. Um, beyond that, all the other trails are a little bit up for discussion of what those become, and both in width and materials and everything. Um, but they, our expectation now, at least from what I've heard from from stakeholders, is that those would be an earthen trail surface. Um, so most of those trails would be converted to just a more kind of traditional trail. Well, and it'll probably be an opportunity for you planners to incorporate what is learned uh, from the working group, right? I mean, that's part of why that working group is um, addressing these issues, how to reduce conflicts. And I think that's a, a real advantage to your planning here. L let me... Uh, let me ask the question, this came up during the public, the first public session, and that is Empire Mine Road. Empire Mine Road is, as we know, a highly used uh, bicycle and pedestrian uh, route, right? It's an old road that was closed to, to automobiles. And it skirts right close to this, to the golf course, the now converted park why aren't we connecting the Empire Mine Road so there would be another way for pedestrians and bicyclists to get into this section of the park without having to drive to a parking lot? Oh, I'm gonna answer that one. Um, Empire Mine Road is, um, is, is not an officially closed road. So it is still a, a, still a public road that um, theoretically um, could be used for vehicular circulation. Um, it does not serve very many properties, and I think most uh, most uh, everybody is in agreement that that uh, that that road should be closed permanently. I know the City of Antioch uh, has communicated that, um, and they have closed it on a temporary basis for uh, for quite some time. But I think it was in 2018 or so, um, under the state vehicular code. Um, they could no longer um, extend the temporary closure of that road. So technically it is open, nobody uses it right now, but it does serve um, one private property. Um, and, uh, and so they have not been able to um, permanently close it. If that road were to be permanently closed and if the decision were to be made by 
um, by Antioch, um, whose jurisdiction it is, that that would be a pedestrian facility, um, then certainly we would absolutely want to connect to it. And it does, I agree with you, Director Coffey, make a logical pedestrian connection. Um, but at this point, it is, um, somebody could make the argument that if we were to do that, that we would be dropping pedestrians onto a, um, a roadway that is not um, uh, designed or, uh, or rated for, for pedestrian access. So while it functions like a trail right now, technically it's a road, if that makes sense. Well, it makes sense. It's just as a practical matter, it, it doesn't resonate with me since I've always been used to this, uh, this road as, as a closed pedestrian and bicycle. Um, uh, yeah, agreed. And I think we have had conversations with the city of Antioch and others about how we could help um, make that closure permanent and, you know, formalize the use that we see of it now, which is as a biking and uh, pedestrian roadway. And I think we're, we're very interested in continuing to do that. As you know, there are um, uh, a number of different plans for that Sand Creek focus area. So um, it starts to open up a, a bit of other conversations regarding future development that's proposed within that area. Okay, it's also, you, you know, would provide access to Starmine uh, Trail which is Correct, currently yeah. banked, but again, that would uh, allow for connections directly with the uh, Black Diamond through Starmine Trail. So I, I would just have in the back of our minds that there will be a need for a connection to Empire Mine Road. Um, what was the other question I had? Will people be assess assessing the park from Empire Mine Road anyway, you know, much as people do up on coming Skyway to get into Crockett Hills. <laughs> Even though there's technically not no access, people will make access. Is that a concern? Uh, that, yes, there, um, there is an existing access point. I just pulled up the, the plan view map uh, right at Right. Near the bend in Empire Mine Road, this is looking north. There is a access road that comes here to the pump, the former pump station. One of our design plans has that as a potential connection, although okay. uh, a concern through the the habitat um, regulatory agencies is getting really close to habitat restoration. Right. Uh, one of the rules is you have to have a three hundred foot buffer around any wetland habitat, so that may be a challenge. There could be some other spots. We've um, we've got marked here potential uh, connections outside of Roddy Ranch. These little purple arrows. Uh, those may or may not ever come to fruition. But one of our overarching goals is is to connect up to Black Diamond somehow, either on or near Empire Mine Road, or somewhere through Forest Valley to the north over the Star Mine Trail, and then uh, other connections somewhere to the south. But yeah, um, yeah, trying to balance the uh, the habitat buffer and um, habitat protection with public access. All right, thank you. Uh, the, I, I remember the other question I had on my mind. It's a topic that I know with my colleagues is very near and dear to us, and that is park naming. <laughs> At what point in this process does that become a matter for input? Well, we've, we've had internal discussions that uh, there may be opportunities through our public meetings to uh, take polls from the audience uh, to, you know, kind of take the temperature of the group, what, what they feel might be an appropriate name, whether that's, you know, keep Roddy Ranch in there somewhere, uh, Deer Valley, uh, native name. We, um, we're having discussions about how to incorporate that moving forward. We're still not, not, near the end of the uh, planning process. So there's still um, a lot of time to, uh, you know, start, start building on that. And Director Coffey, I would suggest that um, that is something that is entirely appropriate for you to provide direction on. Um, if, if, uh, if we should be naming uh, this park as part of this process or um, if we should be considering that. Um, and certainly we can, um, we can, we can, incorporate that, we'll be having public meetings, we can take solicit suggestions. And um, of course it's the board's 
decision on uh, what the future name will be. So, so we would welcome your input and direction on when um, you want to take that up. Okay, so let's all just think about it. Okay, thank you. John? Uh, great, this is a great opportunity for us to, uh, to look into, into the future here. Uh, my question is, uh, and I, and I, uh, I second Director Coffey's uh, suggestion that we um, uh, start thinking about naming soon. Uh, and, and, and I believe Deer Valley was uh, one, of the, one of the alternatives uh, that arose from the uh, Concord Naval Weapons Station naming and Thurgood Marshall um, Regional Park and uh, as, a pos as a possibility for uh, acknowledging our Native American um, his heritage here. Uh, also, uh, why is there such a discrepancy of from plan A to plan C uh, in the amount of wetlands that we can develop? Our yeah, that's, that's a great question. You may be uh, referring to this, uh, this table here. Mm -hmm. the, so one of the potential issues with um, plan A, I'll go back to that, is uh, rainfall. This year we got less than four inches of rainfall out there. We don't know if that's gonna be the new normal. Um, I mean, that's equivalent to parts of Death Valley as far as mm -hmm. annual rainfall is one caveat with having so many vernal pools is are we spreading thing, the water too thin and then there's not enough water going down to the deeper wetlands at the base of the hills. So this is certainly an option, but uh, you know, do we, do, we, do we have fewer but deeper pools at the base of the hills that are successful or do we spread it out um, mm -hmm. sort of a shotgun approach? And I think Eric, uh, it looks like you're on. You can probably weigh in on the wetlands uh, numbers between the the alternatives. And you're muted, Eric. <laughs> Thank you. I think I'd have a handle of that by now. Um, one of the one of the things this table is really pointing out and focusing on is just one type of wetland, which is the vernal pool wetland. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that is a specialty habitat, um, which is what was just the habitat, uh, the Conservancy just did the Horse Valley restoration that you're probably, you may be aware of that was just adjacent next door um, to develop vernal pools. And so it's basically the first option concept day is looking at expanding that type of wetland habitat. Uh, but it doesn't, what, what we're not really picking up here on quite as much as the existing ponds that are uh, there that will be converted to wetlands and there's a wetland basins as well. So between the three concepts, there's actually not a big change in what happens to those wetlands. There's subtle changes, but very difficult for the public to pick up on. Um, but those, those are pretty consistent in the level of restoration that would happen. It's really added, the question here is, do we, do we go for vernal pools in this project or not? And, and Eddie is right. We didn't quite get as much information as we wanted to to be able to answer that. So it's on the table as a valid option, but I don't feel comfortable yet with what I know saying that it's gonna be a success if we were to build it or not. We may build depressions that would be dry, you know, every year except for the really wet years. And is it worth putting that money into to building them if they don't really provide much habitat? Hmm. So I'm, I'm taking from this, uh, what you've said so far is that, uh, so these are, these vernal pools are um, from rainfall and not springs? Correct. So they are mostly, vernal pools often are, are just depressions that are slow draining. So they, the rainfall that falls directly on them is the main driver for their existence. It's a slight oversimplification because there is some subsurface flow that occurs and some drainage runoff into them as well. Um, and if you get if you start to dig really deep into these concepts, which would be great um, to do, the first concept A does look at infiltrating water at the very top of the watershed. Mm -hmm. The upper watershed is mainly a sandy loam soil, so it will just infiltrate down. Um, so in this graphic, on all these graphics on the on the left as you're looking in the screen. The idea there is that we would actually collect and encourage that to infiltrate. And there is a hard pan layer underneath that the water will hit and just won't 
go vertical, it'll actually start to go laterally. Downslope, so over time, kind of be dissipated, and then hopefully, ideally, emerge into these vernal pools and help kind of seed these later into the season. Um, so that's, that is the end, either the vernal pools or the wetland features themselves that are already down there. Hmm. Interesting. And then also uh, uh, in concept A, the bioretention in the parking lot, is that, is that the parking lot? And then in C, it's further down the road. Why can't you have both? Uh, you can. <laughs> there's, oh. a, there's probably the answer to that for a lot of your questions is you probably can. There are millions of permutations. Um, the, and actually, both of them are pretty feasible. Just the way the existing storm drain network works is we can kind of do both. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, there's no reason to do both and, uh, for this case because I think the parking area itself has enough of a collection to treat all that parking lot um, in itself without having to rely on the the downslope one. I mean, it may be that we come up with some ideas and we want to do more traditional landscaping in the parking area. And then, then we would move most of the bioretention downslope. So it's, it's an option. Okay. And then um, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad that we're, we're looking at uh, trail flow as far to uh, reduce conflicts. Is there a way to incorporate concepts in, in C to B? Yes. So they really are, this, in a, a lot of ways, it's a kit of parts. I mean, certainly there's things that, that affect each other, so it's harder to do certain things, or maybe it's one, one idea lends itself better to be paired with another. But certainly the trails, for the most part, they're interchangeable. Um, I think the, the trick for us is because this is conservancy land first and foremost is how to reduce conflicts and make sure the habitat is really performing to the best of our ability and we can uh, address it. But the idea of separated traffic for, so bikes have a nice downhill and then a nice uphill, um, that, that idea could probably be manifested in any alternative. Okay, great. And then uh, regarding the parking lot, well, uh, Will there be enough room there to um, accommodate horse trailers? Yeah, just the just because of the way the photo was taken, that part of the parking lot is clipped off in the foreground below. Oh, but okay. <laughs> it is in all concepts. If you once you see the plan view, when you when you get access to those, you will see that um, in the yeah. Now Eddie has that up. So just to the uh, yeah, right where Eddie's pointing, that it's a nice spot to do that. Okay, great. And then um, we, so all these documents are on our website um, and the public can see those. So regarding your, um, um, your public, your public uh, comment period, uh, the, the one um, or the ones that you had so far, how many people attended? Oh, the, uh, the first public meeting, we had about 50 members of the public and um, got great feedback. We, we had um, some folks also submit emails. They said they couldn't attend the meeting, but had submitted emails ahead of time and folks who saw the reporting later on. So we've, we've got that all up on the web and it's, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have these drafts up for maybe a couple of months. And we, you know, the, the meeting itself is not the only place and only time that the public will be able to chime in. We're, we're open the, to comments throughout this process and ultimately we'll take all of this feedback and uh, steer it toward a preferred alternative. Okay, good. I, I think it's, we should stress that the people don't have to actually attend the meetings but uh, to, to make a comment, so that would be good. And then for the July 1st, are you planning that to be in person or a hybrid? That's the, it's going to be online. We're still we're do, still doing the world of Zoom. Um, we've discussed potentially having uh, some sort of on-site event, maybe in the fall when the weather cools a bit. Um, it's it's hot and dry out there right now, but um, you know it's going to depend on uh, if there are any COVID restrictions at that time and what capacity is going to look like and and what we're working with. But we'd love to get folks on site uh, on site. Uh, I think, as we all know, there's a bit of uh, Zoom fatigue uh, over the last year or so, and people want to see the real deal. So we're we're um, considering some dates in the fall. Great. And then uh, 
is the uh, is the service yard for for a crew going to be at the Roddy Ranch, or is it going to be incorporated in this plan here? It, the <clears throat> so currently this land is managed by the the park staff at Black Diamond Mines. Uh, they have a couple of rangers assigned to the the larger Deer Valley uh, property. Um, down the road at the, it, it's not showing on this map, but kind of to the southwest at the end of Chadbourne, there is a future operations um, center there. And so that may be the park headquarters. Uh, we're not anticipating really a, a, any sort of park headquarters up here at Roddy Ranch or at the, uh, the former golf course. Okay. But within, you know, within a half mile or so. Okay. That, that sounds good. I mean, I, I would think uh, once this park goes into operation, it would outgrow uh, Black Diamond's capacity <laughs> to manage. Um, I wonder if there was something else I was going to ask on that. Oh, speaking of which, uh, so when are we looking at possible construction? We, we need to work out those details with uh, the design and construction department, but um, first step is to get the plan adopted, which we're hoping would be later this year, maybe early next year, once we've done all the environmental review, have a preferred alternative and a final plan. And um, after that, we, we need to consider funding sources, whether that's uh, general fund or through grants. Uh, so we'll work with the grants department on that. Um, beyond that, I don't have too much detail, but perhaps one of our department managers, if Brian, if you're still on the line, if you want to fill us in on that, that part of the process. It's, it's, that's always the trickiest question. And it's always, um, it's always the first question. And I see Lisa's popping up on here. Um, I'll just share, this is, this is one of, of many projects that, that, we're working on um, and uh, working on in partnership with DECO. And we're having a lot of conversations about, um, you know, how to best prioritize um, these projects and really coming up with a good sort of pipeline as we go from, you know, acquisition into planning and then into, into design and construction. So, um, you know, Lisa has a full work plan right now, um, but definitely, you know, the prior, no, this is a, is a uh, definitely a, a interest of the board. So, um, so uh, with that, Lisa, is there, do you want to say anything on sort of how this will move into that next phase? Yeah, thank you, Brian. Um, good afternoon, Lisa Gorgian, Chief of Design and Construction. And um, I liked it when Eddie said Zoom fatigue. I feel like my Zoom skills are going backwards. It took me a couple minutes to try to get my screen back. So um, yeah, Brian and, and uh, obviously ASD, Christina has been, been um, having conversations, recognizing that we have a lot of projects uh, that are at various stages of readiness. And so um, I think as Brian and Eddie mentioned at the beginning, really the um, deliverable for this project is to get a, um, a preferred concept. So, um, you know, it's, um, there's a lot of, there's stages after that. So, um, you know, it, we're fortunate to be working with the HCP. Um, that sort of advances a lot of the environmental uh, regulations that would um, typically come with a project like this, just in terms of development. And of course, because it was formally developed. So um, this is all to say, um, you know, this is something that we'll be bringing um, obviously to the GM, uh, GM Landreth and Christina and, and, um, and then on up to the board, just in terms of um, uh, to help us, you know, evaluate and prioritize. So we will, um, as Brian mentioned, and I have a large truck going by, sorry, um, it's garbage day. We um, really try to integrate with an ASD. So one of our landscape architects who's on vacation this week has been on the project team so that when we're ready to, uh, when we get direction to start with the construction, or I, I don't even wanna, there's like a whole bunch of work that happens in between finalizing a concept plan and breaking ground. So in terms of all the work and uh, that we need to get done, we feel really pleased to have had somebody from design and construction who can um, kind of the, the roles sort of switch. So. Right now she's supporting the team and then she'll take over as, as the lead. And then of course, we'll still have Eddie 
supporting as well. So um, that's all to say, um, that's a great question and uh, we'll look forward to getting some more guidance uh, on that. Uh, Director Rosario, if I may. Yes. Thank you. Lisa. Welcome. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Ana Alvarez, Deputy General Manager, and I appreciate the effort, um, Brian and Lisa, in, in attempting to provide you the most informed uh, answer to your question, Director Rosario. The reality, what we're referring to here, what staff is trying to refer to, is capacity. So I appreciate that the uh, preliminary work is being done uh, in response to the interest of the board. When you have in the past prioritized this project as part of your past board workshops. So that getting the project to be ready is one phase. Then the second phase will be actually the financing and the construction, which is what Lisa was referring to. And that, uh, that phase will be brought back to you as part of your board workshops so that you can help us prioritize within the work plan of design and construction, what are the, those projects that require priority uh, and attention where we can invest the staff capacity that we currently have and also financing. So that brings us back to that uh, pending conversation pertaining to long-term planning, which includes not only capacity, but also fiscal planning for the board directors, which we're hoping that we can engage with you relatively soon. On. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the board? Director Corbett. Thank you. Yeah, I did want to ask a few questions and appreciate those comments that the AGM, uh, excuse me, the DGM just made on um, how we pay for it all. <laughs> we always have to be looking forward to that. Um, I was um, hoping to see the three maps together because I actually had some questions about the, the wetland issues and I'll start with um, the first. So the vernal pools and other wetland features we're looking at, are they primarily pre-existing or are we talking about um, increasing them or just enhancing what's there? Um, you know, because obviously I think a goal will be to preserve what we do have and make sure whatever planning we do, um, we benefit what's there and the species that may already be on the site and those that may uh, come back in additional numbers because it's uh, less of a golf course and more of an open space. Yes, it's a, it's a highly, uh, thank you for, for that question. It's, it's a highly modified site. Um, something like 600,000 cubic yards of earth were moved in order to create the contours of the golf course. Uh, there were a few areas that were untouched, but for the most part, it's it's been modified. The vernal pools, as uh, and Eric, if you're still here, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, do not exist on site. They would be created as habitat. Um, one of the goals of the Habitat Conservation Plan, the HCP in East Contra Costa County Habitat Conservancy, is not only restoring, but also creating habitat. And so that there may be the case where we're putting in habitat that didn't exist there before. And, you know, much of this land is set aside as mitigation for construction projects in East County. So there may be um, uh, loss of uh, vernal pools in one place, and then we need to create vernal pools in a new place to make mm -hmm. up for that. So I, um, that, that's my sort of 35,000 foot um, understanding of um, how this system works. Oh, that's so, good to hear. Mm -hmm. I think sensitivity to that in this this new project is is extremely important. Um, and then I do have some questions. I, I too am concerned about the um, the pathway or the trail surfaces, um, and I look at it from a little bit different angle in that. Um, I'm assuming that older concrete pathways are not necessarily sustainable, um, you know, over time as land settles and the usage and, um, you know, I'll, I'll leave it up to the experts, but I think of course, closely looking at the surfacing of the trails will be important and uh, patching old concrete trails probably won't look as nice or be as 
sustainable as something else. And I'm sure since we're looking at the um, environmental issues in this area too, that permeability of trails would be something important to take a look at as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I too am hoping that we have surfaces that are compatible with the uses and, and the environment around it. And um, I do, um, I very appreciate, I think it was more highlighted maybe on A or B, I'm not sure, but uh, the fact that there's been some real thought into accessible trails as an emphasis. Yes. I really appreciate that. Uh, I think that that's important. And then also um, the work that's being done to determine how to, um, have various uses and um, deal with a, a pre-plan in advance uh, to avoid conflicts when we can, mm -hmm. which I think uh, we have a great uh, opportunity to do with this new new park. So I appreciate that too. Let me see what other notes I have here. I think that's it. So um, tell me a little bit about uh, surfacing of the trails and what the thoughts are there. Um, so the, our overarching plan is to reuse as much infrastructure as possible. So that would include the cart paths uh, where it deviates. Um, I don't know if we've quite made the decision yet on creating a new cart path. So it's consistent uh, paved trail or if it would uh, only be paved in the existing sections and then the new sections would be um, natural surface trails. I think for equestrians and, and mountain bikers, the preference would be a natural surface trail. Uh, folks who, are you, who have strollers or are in wheelchairs perhaps uh, may prefer a more solid surface. So I anticipate we would have a mix of that. Uh, you bring up a good point about long-term maintenance. Uh, a lot of the uh, concrete on site is not reinforced. So if you drive mm -hmm. a truck across it, um, it may buckle. They were really meant for lighter weight golf car carts or people um, walking. So we, we haven't quite arrived to that. Um, well, we haven't made any decisions on that. And we've, we've only begun very preliminary discussions at this point. But I, I, I guess the short answer is it would be a mix likely of natural surface and um, existing cart paths. Okay. We're taking into consideration um, parts of the paths that might not be worth keeping because of their extra costs to maintain them with the original surfacing maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, especially in light of the fact they're not reinforced, but that makes it easier for them to remove. <laughs> yeah, that is true. It's the silver lining. <laughs> all right, that's all I have, thank you. Okay. Eric Coffey. One final thought. Uh, before the first public meeting, Eddie, mm -hmm. uh, we did some outreach with the city of Antioch. Mm -hmm. Make sure they were aware of uh, both the a planning session and in general what what stage we were at. Um, I, I think we should make a similar effort, um, again, subject to your time and, and mm -hmm. ability, um, but we should make a similar effort with uh, Brentwood and mm -hmm. uh, its leadership. Um, I think this is within the planning sphere of the city of Antioch. Uh, it was at one point going to be a, a, a new subdivision in, in Antioch. Uh, but the nearby neighborhoods off of Balfour are actually Brentwood neighborhoods. So the, peak, the, the actual neighborhoods that are going to be close to the entry of this park are, are Brentwood neighborhoods. So I think it'd be uh, ideal if we had the time uh, to do it, to do some, some outreach to the city yes, of Brentwood. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, and you, you, you're correct that uh, this is within Antioch city limits, um, but the closest existing neighborhoods are down Balfour Road just to the east, um, which is the city of Brentwood. Yeah, and they're growing in the direction of this park. Mm -hmm. Great. So what's the source of uh, water for um, this area for the existing golf course? Was it? Yeah, that, uh, great question. So um, water was brought on site and um, or actually there, there's a well at the very bottom here. It's not, I don't know if it really shows up on your screen. Uh, at the edge of the parking lot, there is a well 
that we have had tested uh, and we anticipate being able to use for restrooms and drinking water. It, it pumps at about 10 gallons per minute, which wouldn't be enough to water the golf course, but, um, or, or bringing back a golf course, but enough for running water, uh, flush toilets if it's feasible. Uh, the source of the water is water would be pumped down into those large ponds, which are down at the bottom, kind of near Empire Mine Road, mm -hmm. and then pumped back up into the sprinkler system. So those were like little reservoirs that held water for much of the year, and then we get pumped up um, to the mm -hmm. surface. So as far as I know, there's just the one well that was tapped into. I don't think we have a connection to any city utilities um, as far as water goes. Interesting. I do believe they were connected to the East Contra Costa County Irrigation District. Um, and there's a meter that's down near Deer Valley Road. So, and of course the cost of water um, and the need to irrigate the golf course was you know, ultimately, um, ultimately what um, was part of the contributing factor that led to, led to the, the closure of the, the golf course. Director Corbett. So along those same lines in the planning, are we pretty much, um, are we looking to put in irrigated areas or will we pretty much allow it, whatever the natural surrounding areas, uh, how they appear? You know, we, season, seasonal rain and then gold in one part of the year, green other parts of the year. Yes, the, uh, the anticipation is that uh, there, there would be no mechanical irrigation, maybe some hand watering of uh, perhaps a few shade trees around the, the parking lot mm -hmm. or near the, uh, the picnic tables, but we're not planning to irrigate it like you would see a contraloma just up the road with irrigated lawns. Uh, we, want, we want to return it to a natural habitat and also um, it's an opportunity for the public to appreciate uh, the, the natural landscape and how the, um, the colors of the grass change with the seasons. So gold in the summer, uh, green most winters. This winter it wasn't so green, but uh, just let it breathe naturally. Yeah, but that makes sense with, uh, you know, where we're going with uh, water availability as well. So um, can I ask one more question about one of the slides, the slides that shows the um, drainage, I guess, for lack of a better word. Oh, okay. So the sort of overarching yeah. plan view. Yeah. So what does this show what happens in the event of rainstorms or, you know, is this an issue of, uh, flooding when it does rain or what, what is this, what is this trying to characterize to us? Um, these are uh, essentially showing miniature watersheds. And so we have, oh. I believe seven basins, mm -hmm. uh, at the West and below the parking lot. So, um, this is, this is the, uh, existing condition of the site and the, the draft, um, alternative concepts, uh, there may be some shifting, uh, from one drainage into the other to make uh, water flow so that uh, wetland habitat is more sustainable. Uh, there's also a whole underground um, system, I think about 10 miles of underground pipes that convey water from the surface. And it originally ran under the golf course and would feed the ponds at the base. And so some of those um, may be in disrepair or have to be removed in order to return the land to a natural topography. And so careful planning has to take place so that we don't create um, gullies from uh, mm -hmm. water sheeting down the hillside and um, damaging trails that we build and, and undermining um, the surface. And so Eric and his team with Restoration Design Group has put a lot of thought into that. And so when they developed the alternative concepts, it was taking all of that into account. But yeah, these are, these are basically little watersheds and it's just primarily rainwater that falls and then heads up toward Empire Mine Road to the north. Okay, that's very helpful. You know, likely that area won't get a whole lot of rain, but that doesn't mean that when it does, there might be situations where there could be um, flooding that uh, impacts infrastructure and trails and those sorts of things. So mm -hmm. I very much appreciate that extra thought on that. That's yeah. uh, very forward thinking and uh, thank you. Good, glad to hear. <laughs> okay. 
Any other questions? Seeing none, I think we're, we are uh, ready. Okay. A great, great presentation. Uh, and uh, the environmentalist in me likes, likes the concept A, but just because of climate change, you know, B might be the, the most uh, palatable for, for me, but um, I'm glad we're thinking of, uh, thinking forward about uh, not only conservation, but also um, trail conflicts and, and trail, trail use. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Director Rosario, I believe Abby Fateman has her hand up. I'm not oh, sure great. she wants to make a comment. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, good afternoon, um, members of uh, board of directors. Um, I just wanted to chime in just quickly and say that uh, this has been a great collaborative process working with Eddie and Restoration Design Group and the regional parks team. and. Um, I really appreciate the effort that they've taken, um, that our agencies are sort of, this is a new step in working together to move both of these things forward at the same time. And it was a, a confluence of, uh, you know, funding and timing and resources that all came together at the same time and it's working very well for this. And I, I just wanna extend a thank you to, to the park district and commend staff um, for being open to this process and, and working together on it. It's been, um, I, think, I think it's been a good process for all of us. And, um, this is also a very unique and exciting project. Um, restoring a golf course is not something that you get to do every day. And so um, I think it's a challenge both um, academically and professionally to sort of navigate what do we want to see? What's our vision? What's realistic? Um, uh, and and it's, it's been a great team to be exploring, exploring those opportunities with. So I, I just wanted to reach out and say thank you to Eddie and the team he has pulled together um, in moving this process forward. Great, thank you. Thanks, Abby. Always great to work with you, Abby. HCP. <laughs> nice to see you, Abby. Oh, uh, one last question before I go is: uh, uh, Are we anticipating importing any soil to this project, or is it all going to be dealing with what we have on the ground? It it hasn't come up. I um, I assume that we will not need to import any soil. Um, at the site, but I don't think it's really come up. Maybe Lisa, if you have a thought. Yes, hi again, good afternoon. So I just um, maybe wanted to share, um, clarify that the these plans, they're so wonderful because they show us, um, you know, the, at the end we'll have a concept that shows what do we want to build there? What's, how can the district advance its mission? And, um, but, and so they really tell us, um, what do we want to build and is it buildable? But they, but you can't build from these plans. So kind of to answer your question, do we need fill? You know, what we, we're, we don't even have a preferred concept yet. And so I think that I would think would be part of the evaluation into a preferred concept is you usually want to balance cut and fill. So that'll be some of the things that we'll be looking at. So I think, um, I think these are great questions and, you know, we're all, I'm taking notes and stuff and, but I did just thought maybe to clarify, that's kind of the difference between a concept plan where we we're identifying, is it buildable, but you can't build from that nope. plan. We don't, we don't have enough information. That's in my head, a, a way that I think about it. Uh oh, can't hear you. <laughs> Couldn't hear you, D. Oh, I, Lisa, we lost, we lost, we lost the, probably your last uh, thirty seconds there. Oh, I, I was just saying, I, I hope I didn't overstep. I just, um, it's, it's helpful for me to think about it that way. So, th thank you. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> thank you so D, do you have some dredge spoils you're looking to put somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have a couple of those sites. <laughs> Thank you so much. And now we are at um, and here we are now at item number three, the McKay Avenue Master Plan Update and Draft Alternatives, Crown Memorial State Beach. Yeah, good. Um, thank you, Director Rosario. Uh, good afternoon. Um, 
Brian Holt, Chief of Planning Trails GIS. I am uh, pitch hinting somewhat uh, on this project. The project manager is uh, Tony Covarrubias. She's out today, so uh, we wanted to take this opportunity to bring this bring this forward. Uh, similarly, um, to as we have some draft concepts um, that to to start to get some input. So we're at the same place uh, on this project where we're just starting to take some concepts and wanting to you know gauge which direction we're going. Um, again, these are these are plans that are, um, you know, long ranging. Um, this plan is it has a fifty year horizon or so. So it's not to say that um, that uh, these will these will just sort of guide long term actions as we start to look towards um, improvements there. So with that, I'll share my screen here. Uh, so that we're talking the the McKay Avenue Master Plan. Um, and uh, reviewing the draft, uh, dra draft concepts for this area. Uh, the primary uh, park expansion area is the 3.89 acres of the, um, the former GSA property. Um, so, uh, and that area is highlighted there. Um, the master plan area does also include some of the surrounding areas, including the, the, the intertidal ramp area out there, Gloria of the Seas building, the Crab Crow Visitor Center, um, and McKay Avenue itself. Um, those lands are are owned by the state of California. So, um, so while we're making some, we're looking at some draft concepts here. You know, long term, we're going to have to work with state parks, the state of California, um, and others as we sort of as we if we decide to move forward and implement any of these. So, with that um, and planning process. Um, you know, this project was initiated in 2019 with the hiring of a consultant. We've had uh, PlaceWorks and a team of some consultants uh, uh, assisting on that. Um, so we developed the existing conditions report and had a, a community uh, outreach survey. Um, and then we've done a number of uh, uh, focused meetings with uh, city staff um, and other interested stakeholders in Alameda. Um, and then now we're at the point that we're, de we're developing the draft concepts um, and uh, bringing those forward for um, consideration. We will be engaging in a series of community outreach uh, sessions throughout the summer, um, envisioning those to be more um, on-site uh, pop-up type of outreach at Crab Cove, uh, sort of multiple times, so not in one big public meeting, but given COVID and a number of other things and just Crab Cove lends itself to, to some smaller um, sort of pop-up outreach type of uh, engagement. Um, and then in winter uh, 2021 and into next year, we'll finalize the master plan. We'll start looking at sort of phasing, um, of course, developing some, cons some cost estimates. And then that's when we can start talking about, you know, what aspects of this plan might move forward um, in the near term versus So again, we did uh, develop that uh, existing conditions report um, and that is available on the website. I believe it's mckaymasterplan.com. Um, um, the community outreach, the community survey results generally, there's a lot more detail behind, um, behind this bar chart, but generally what we heard is um, a lot of support for habitat and habitat areas, um, a real interest in sea level rise adaptation, um, interest in more trails, expanded recreation space, um, some interest in shaded spaces and expanded beach, um, more educational services and, and then more picnic areas uh, down sort of towards the bottom there. Um, and in that survey, we did get 400 responses. 70% uh, of those were Alameda residents and 90% and between 31 and 65 years old. So this whole plan is really based on the recognition that uh, much of the existing facilities at um, uh, Crown Beach and Crab Cove uh, will be impacted by, um, by sea level rise. So you can see some of the projections here through 2070, which is um, kind of the, the horizon that we're looking at with regards to 2070 or with regards to um, developing this concept. So incorporating uh, potential for sea level rise there just looking at how we um, adapt and provide a, a more resilient park. Hmm. So the three concepts, the three uh, that have been developed, um, similarly to the last, we, we identified one that's more recreation focused, a recreation destination. 
Um, number two, more open space sort of gathering area, open space retreat. Um, and then number three, the, the educational bayfront. Um, and this is, at, this is at what would be full build out. So this is again, that sort of 2070 horizon. So it's not to suggest that um, we would just be able to build this um, at any point, but it's sort of how do we, um, how do we phase this in to incorporate sea level rise and, and improve the area that we have now. Um, some common elements in each is that the existing, um, what's called in here operations yard, what I think we call service yard, um, would be located, relocated from its existing location behind Crab Cove um, to the rear of the property. Um, but each plan looks at sort of a different size of a service yard. So some, some bigger, some smaller. Um, similarly, each plan looks at some expanded parking um, and, uh, and that parking is largely located at um, the terminus of McKay um, and some areas with more parking, some with less. Um, of course, the Crab Cove Visitor Center um, uh, remains um, in the first two plans. Um, you'll see in the third plan, uh, there's potential for that area to be inundated at, at 2050. So um, that, would be, that would be a consideration there. Um, each looks at some repurposing of the Glory of the Seas building. Uh, the first concept has, has it as a museum, and the second has a community venue, and then the third as a, as a coastal education center. Um, the Bay Trail, ex of course, exists throughout. Um, the, uh, and then they have different strategies with regards to the spit where that would be underwater um, and whether that uh, one facility or one concept proposes developing a pier while that, um, while that upland is still available. So you're not developing in the water, developing a pier there and eventually the water would sort of rise um, to the pier. Um, as sea level rise comes up. And so you'd still have some uh, waterfront access going out there and some potential for fishing. Or perhaps as in the second concept, um, it's enhanced more for aquatic habitat or the third is more passive retreat. So those are kind of the elements of each of these. And again, um, none of these are to suggest that we pick concept one, concept two, concept three, uh, but more you know, to kind of gauge which elements of the different ones do, do we like versus others. So I'll go into a little bit more detail now. So for the recreation destination, this is the, the first, um, it's a more active destination um, at the end of McKay Avenue at Crown Beach. Uh, includes an outdoor gathering space that could seat uh, 20 people. The idea is that this could be kind of used in conjunction with Crab Cove for as kind of an outdoor classroom um, and for other, uh, for other uses, community uses. And again, that observation pier that um, could be developed at this time while it's still sort of an upland area, but recognizing that eventually that'll be over water as sea level uh, comes as, as the, uh, the bay rises in that area. Um, and then uh, a protective levee, um, built around the perimeter of the site with that would have the Bay Trail. Um, and then, um, and then of course the, uh, this concept has a, a large operations yard and large operations facility, um, and then some expanded uh, parking uh, basically in front of Crab Cove, uh, an open recreation meadow with some trails going through there. Um, and then of course, uh, landscaping to, to screen the operations facilities and, and the um, adjacent neighborhood. Um, so open space retreat, uh, similar where we, um, we continue to maintain Glory of the Seas as a community venue, uh, Crab Cove, some trails throughout the site, just a more open uh, recreation meadow, but then heavier landscaping with some trails that go through an area that they refer to as the Ramble. Um, most of the parking concentrated up towards the end of McKay Avenue, slightly smaller service yard, um, and then no access over the water and the spit would be uh, enhanced for, for aquatic habitat as the bay rises there. Um, and we see, uh, and we see um, some tidal marsh and beach habitat created uh, in this other area where um, we see the sea coming in. So one of, the, I mean, one of the major differences between each of these alternatives is really where the terminus of McKay Avenue happens whether McKay Avenue is extended into 
uh, Crown Beach uh, and to in front of Crab Cove and, and to uh, Glory of the Seas kind of as it is now, or whether uh, McKay is sort of retreated and brought back sort of as you see at this concept at the terminates at, at the, the edge of the former GSA property. And then the educational bayfront component. So uh, again, this is more passive inundation in the, the Eastern area um, that would just, we would uh, retreat as, um, as the bay rises, um, the bay trail would um, exist through this site. Um, and then we would have to ultimately look at bringing it inward um, long-term uh, as, as uh, sea level rise comes in. Um, and, then, and then similar to the original concept, a boardwalk that's developed over what's currently upland that would eventually provide some access uh, over there. Um, and so you can see kind of how each, each plan take, uh, takes an approach to, to bay level rise. Um, and, and so the first uh, has more of a protected levee kind of at the, where the existing shoreline is now. And that levee would be developed, you know, uh, ahead of, um, experiencing the impacts of sea level rise. And that would provide more space throughout for gathering picnic areas and recreational meadow. The second brings that protective lovely inland a bit. And so allows for a bit more uh, habitat restoration uh, in the bay um, uh, through uh, by, by bringing that area in um, and then the recreation area um, and growth. And then the educational bay front is where there isn't necessarily the protective levee and there's just more of a, a passive inundation, sort of uh, uh, passive uh, or true nature-based sort of uh, adaptation strategy. So this is just an example, of kind of just how phasing um, phasing would sort of go in as you know we'd be looking at the the initial improvements um, early on, and again this this isn't. This is a plan, not a project. So we would be looking at what projects, you know, would be able to move forward in the near term phase one, which might be the parking improvements and service yard improvements and, and the meadow, those things that we know. Um, and then phase two would be looking at the more um, uh, adapt adaptation strategies, uh, developing that protective levy in anticipation of, of bay level rise so over a longer course, and then phase three more where we see um, the actual uh, impacts of sea level rise sort of coming in and kind of what that looks like at Bill hmm. And so with that, um, I am happy to, happy to answer any questions. Um, again, next steps for us will be to, um, these uh, concepts will be posted on the website and we will be sharing these with, um, with the city of Alameda, who we've been working really closely with on this um, and, uh, and with the public and giving public input on that. Um, and, then, uh, and then, like I say, a series of sort of pop-up public engagement at, at Crab Cove throughout the summer. Um, and then uh, taking in all that input and uh, putting it together and you know, developing a, a, preferred, a preferred concept that, that we can then move forward with and, uh, and look towards um, look towards what the next steps are as we as we start to talk about future implementation. Great, thank you. Questions from the board, Director Corbett. Thank you, Brian. Um, really appreciate this presentation. Um, my first question is: Do we have a time frame for the summer pop ups yet? Yeah, I believe um, I believe the idea is in uh, starting uh, July that um, we would be able to do some of those. Okay. Um, when you get the dates, please let me know. Yeah. No. Absolutely. We will. Um, we will specifically coordinate that with you. Okay. Thank you. And um, appreciate the fact that uh, we'll be able to have those pop ups down by Crab Cove because, as you know, that's a very well used and beloved area. <laughs> so I'm sure we'll get a lot of input. Um, I wanted to uh, congratulate you on the um, sensitivity to planning and taking into consideration the bay level rise, because I think that was really 
really so important and smart thing to do, especially since this is going to take many years. It really doesn't make sense to plan to build something that we know by the time it's built, we'll have to change the plans again. So I uh, very much appreciate all of your uh, forward thinking on that. Don't appreciate that the bay is rising, but <laughs> appreciate your forward thinking. And uh, I like bits and pieces of uh, all three plans. I uh, very much appreciate uh, and hope whatever we do, that it does become some sort of educational center. I think that's a really great thing for us to do, especially right there on the short line so we can um, help uh, educate those of, uh, in the future our future leaders um, to be concerned about issues that impact Bay Level Rise. And I see it as sort of a, um, a corollary to what we do at Big Break on the Delta. You know, the work that we do there to share with people the importance of the Delta and, and what it really means to the surrounding economy and, and uh, how important um, protecting the environment that area is to the entire region. I see this as an opportunity to do that sort of thing on the Bayfront. So I really appreciate um, uh, the plan that, that uh, implements some of that. Um, I do have a question, on uh, uh, some very specific questions. One, with regard to operations and uh, the, uh, the um, courtyard concept, would that be built just for the, would that service uh, just the Alameda area or what, what would be the thought on that? Yeah. Um, well, here's here's AGM Jim O'Connor, so I'll let him uh, him answer that. Uh, good afternoon, committee members. Jim O'Connor, Assistant General Manager of Operations, Director Corbett. Um, the Crown Beach staff also support the uh, Judge John Sutter Regional Shoreline facility, so this would also support that that park facility also, and then also okay. the you know our uh, area at Encinal Beach and the trail connection along there also. Okay, good to know. Okay, thank you. And then with regard, I appreciate that, Jim. And with regard to the um, protective levy, my question about that is, um, you know, obviously that always looks uh, like a good thing to do, you know, to just sort of hold back and protect the infrastructure behind it. Would it be built with enough breadth and width uh, to actually make a difference um, in protecting infrastructure? Uh, you know what I mean? I mean, how big of an area would that be? Would inundation just surround it or do you know what I mean? Just sort of trying to get a handle on what that would look like if that was an option that we... Uh, yeah, would. so for this site, it, it was it was designed, um, I shouldn't say designed, it was, it was you know conceived and kind of looking at the potential of of it, yes, having the, the breadth and depth to um, to protect those areas that are you know immediately behind it. Now that's not to say you know water will uh, will continue to go in, in elsewhere. So we would have to continue to look at other areas of Crown Beach um, as, as things go in. But so for like I say, the, the glory of the seas building and, and those other areas, that would be kind of ideas. How do we protect that uh, that that lawn area and the proposed uh, uh, proposed expansion area in GSA, um, and then we'll continue to have to look at you know, the other adaptation strategies throughout the shoreline there. Okay, and I also, the last thing I would say is, um, I do think we should think very seriously about how future inundation could impact the Crab Cove Visitor Center and the consideration to possibly moving it to the GSA site might be a very practical thing to do if it if it sincerely is in that pathway where we may have to say goodbye to it uh, after a number of years it might make sense to start planning ahead to move it so that it's still uh, able to be around to you know continue to provide environmental education along our shoreline yeah the, the third concept that's more of a passive inundation that would um, that would, uh, as I showed, um, result in some level of sea level rise at Crown Cove. Does envision relocating that um, mm -hmm. to the site over to the to the service area over by where the operations center is. Um, so I think that's that's part of the consideration. Is, you know, do we 
Do we build up this protective levy that protects the existing crab cove where it's at now, or do we allow for this uh, inundation and, and plan to move it? So that's a that's a that's a great comment. Thanks, I appreciate. It. Yeah, I think thinking ahead is uh, something we'll we'll need to do. But in any event, it looks it looks wonderful, and I, uh, you know, I I really like the piece about it becoming a, an education center. I think that that uh, goes along with what we do here at the park district. So thank you very much. Look forward to the pop-ups. <laughs> I think you're muted, Director Rosario. Yeah, Director Coffey. Sorry, thank you. I'm for whichever of the plans allows for continuation of concert at the Coves for the next uh, <laughs> years. That's, that's my... <laughs> that's, uh, concert that's up here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that we're, uh, we're looking forward enough to uh, consider inundation because... Um, uh, it's better to, to plan for it now than have to do it right at the moment. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's a shame we put so much money into um, uh, the Crab Cove Visitor Center just recently, but it is what it is, I guess. Well, the good thing, the good thing is, is that sea level rise, and this is, like I say, sort of projected out to 2070. So, um, so you know, we've yeah. got, we'll, we'll continue. So the, the, the improvements that are there will continue to be enjoyed for, for quite some time. Yeah. Well, uh, as those of us on the board who, uh, who've lived at, le at least that long, it's it goes by like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, I'm really happy. I, I really advocate for uh, ending uh, uh, McKay Street uh, uh, at the GSA property because uh, it just creates a bigger open space for the, for the park. Uh, and uh, be a, a lovely, it would be a shame to have that parking lot inside the park. It's better on the outside, I think. But I, I think we're headed in the right direction. And uh, I support uh, Director Corbett's uh, observations on, uh, on the Education Center. I, I think that's, that's, our, that's a huge uh, part of what uh, we'll be doing teaching and showing about what inundation is and, and how to build around it. Well, thank, thank you. you very, yeah, Great. thank you very much. Yes, and then um, uh, any other comments from, from board members or staff? Can I ask a general question? Does anybody know when um, we, it might be safe enough for us to start going out and doing more site visits, field trips, et cetera. Do we have any planning in that direction over the next couple months? Because it would also be very nice. And in fact, I'll, I'll just ask this at some point if I can arrange to go down and walk the GSA site again in looking at um, some of these uh, preliminary plans. I would really like to do that and great to have a field trip too. <laughs> So Director um, Corbett, Deputy General Manager, Dr. Ana Alvarez, and just, um, I jumped on the on the camera very quickly. I should have given an opportunity to a new general manager. <laughs> so I apologize. But to answer your question, we have been having in-person site visits uh, on, in small groups, uh, both with staff and board members. And certainly we will extend an invitation if the board members have an interest in, uh, in attending or visiting a site, we'll be happy to coordinate that. In terms of um, conducting or reestablishing our annual board tours that were a, a good uh, legacy piece of the park district, that's something that we continue to explore. And it's, it's, it's in our work plan as California reopens. So I appreciate the question. Uh, we will certainly share with you more. And right now the um, we're, we're reopening in phases. Um, so certainly the board directors on site visits will be in an item that we can certainly share with you. And I was just got a text from AGM O'Connor that we do have a tour plan. So I appreciate it's in the planning uh, that the first uh, in-person tour will be taking place 
in a few weeks from now, July the 23rd. So Jim, if you'd like to jump in the camera. Uh, this is General Manager Jim O'Connor again. Uh, Director Corbett, in answer to your question, we are in the planning process right now to uh, plan a board tour, uh, which will include uh, the recent improvements at Lone Tree Point, uh, the Bay, new Bay Trail connection in Albany, and we're also going to take a visit to the project that was just completed or is in the process of being completed at Ensenal Beach. So that'll be July 23rd. Uh, we're working on the details and we'll get a communication at the board members soon. Sounds good. Would it be like a sort of a morning event or afternoon or all day? <laughs> Most likely it'll for, for be... For planning uh, purposes. <laughs> I think it's going to be a night... Our normal schedule is nine to three is what we try to keep the board uh, like in that six hour window. So uh, that's what I believe it'll be, but we'll get those details over to you. But uh, the difference here will be is that we will not have any, um, uh, you know, uh, carpool travel, unfortunately, because of COVID. So everybody will have to drive to each of the sites. So that'll be the difference. And then of course, be wearing our masks and keeping our six foot distance uh, during the, the tour. But we'll get some details for you pretty quickly. Okay, thank you so much. You I'll pencil it, it in. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Uh, Dr. Alvarez, would it be possible to uh, bring to the full board uh, the, uh, the phase-in approach of uh, repopulating Peralta Oaks the next meeting? Just a little brief update. Well, thank you, Director Rosario. I can certainly check in with our general manager. Um, we, do, we did make a presentation at the uh, joint labor COVID-19 labor task force of the plan. And we can certainly, with her uh, concurrence, we can add it as part of the general manager's COVID-19 update um, yeah. since we're ready. Great. Yeah, that's, that's what I was, I was thinking. Uh, it would be helpful for the board to, to know um, uh, the district's plan. So, great. So, uh, any other comments or questions? Excellent. Another great meeting. Thank you all. Great presentations. Uh, congratulations to staff. And uh, we will see you soon. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care.